Hello and welcome to episode 44 of the Posecast with Rabbi Shmuel Posner, myself, Seth Hellman. Rabbi, how are we doing today? Baruch Hashem, we're great. I'm back in my seat. I was in Chicago this week. We'll talk about that in a bit. But um, yeah, I had a full day here back in Boston. Flew on Monday, flew back on Tuesday. And I, the whole week seems confusing. I don't know where I am, what time it is, but I know it's Wednesday. And I know that I'm talking to you. 44 is um, in, in Hasid, this talks about man and mad. Mayim nukvin and mayim duchurin. The feminine water and the masculine water. The feminine water is comes from below to above, and then the response is from the below, above to below. That's the, the masculine water. So this is a great time for blessings to come down for Hashem, especially in the month of Adar. So it should be good for everybody. Amen. <laughs> That's the 44. Okay, now were you going to talk to us about the dinner you went to last week? Yeah, so last Thursday, I went to a, a Friends of the IDF dinner, and it was fantastic. Lots of people, lots of lots of young people who showed up to support. So, you know, you make a donation, you show up, you eat some food, you talk to some people, meet some other Jews. It's a very, very good time. And uh, they had the, um, you know, the most powerful part of it was they shared or had uh, an IDF soldier there he was a um was a reserve officer and or i think still is part of the reserves but when october 7th happened he went out to israel he decided you know spur of the moment literally just left his house didn't pack a you know packed maybe a backpack and that was it and hopped on a flight from lax to israel and went there and fought for a few months and you know Baruch Hashem he's safe at the moment but you know his brothers are still fighting and so it was just it was very very powerful to see some of the images that he shared and to hear his story of why he was originally in the IDF and why he decided to go back and you know, fight and his family home in Israel was completely destroyed. There's wow. nothing left. All of his family keepsakes just gone. Um, One second. So his his family had a house like in, in near the. Near so the yeah, house. he he's from Israel originally, born you know born raised in Israel, and then once his time in the IDF was over, he moved to the United States to California and started a business. And his family still lived in Israel. He has two brothers in the IDF, and then his, you know, his parents were still in Israel. And essentially, during it, through the course of the fighting, at some point, a missile hit his family home. You know, wow. his, you know, his family in Israel and destroyed it. And so, you know, all the family keepsakes and, and memories got destroyed. And you know, obviously, that's extremely difficult. And just kind of just hearing from you know obviously i know people in israel and a lot of the people listening to this ha you know know people in israel and we hear things and we see whatever we see on social media and from friends and family and all of that but it's entirely different to hear it directly from someone who is boots on the ground in the middle of all of the fighting and you know, made the active decision to go and fight as opposed right. to you know as brave as it is to already be in the IDF, right? To actually actively take the initiative to hop on a flight spur of the moment and and go out there. And he, you know, he shared his struggles with PTSD from his original stint in the IDF and just his it, it, the will to power through that to me is just outstanding. Yeah, yeah, no question about it. Yeah, I, I think. Um... You know, from so many different sectors, so many different points of, of reference, you know, the, the Jewish identity, the Jewish neshama comes popping out and, you know, it's not even like, he's like, he doesn't even think, you know, he's putting his life on the line. He has a comfortable life where he is here, but he just feels that connection to, to, to Eretz Yisrael and to the people that live there and they go do it. And, I mean, and that's a lot of Americans are not running to Israel to fight, but like doing more mitzvahs and getting more connected to their Jewishness. Yeah, it's a, it's a time of great uh, 
spiritual upheaval in, in, a, in a positive sense. But actually, there's a scheme called, what are they, um, Diplo Act. I don't know, some guy called me this morning. He's, he's in town with a couple other guys. I know they're doing a program in Brighton. So then we come for Shabbat, come Friday night. Also, a couple of guys in, in the, in the um, in res- like all three of them are in, the res- are, are in the reserves and they're just doing this tour of, also just to talk about, I think it's good. I think people, you know, people that, I, I think it's more and more happening that people that were actively involved are coming here to talk about it. And like you said, the impact of hearing from somebody personally who was there is unparalleled to anything you can read because the guy's telling you his experiences. So that's, that's fantastic, yeah. And I hope, yeah, I hope it motivates people to, you know, to care more and to do more and to, and to talk to people that they know. It's not like you don't have to organize a big rally. You just have to like talk to your neighbors, talk to your friend. If somebody mentions something, you can have a conversation with them. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so. First of all, I want. To, it, it, I was thinking about last week. We spoke about going to the doctor, <laughs> <laughs> and I mentioned a couple of doctors. And I realized that I was thinking about to all the students that have come through the Chabad. There's been, been a lot of doctors, and some of them have remained very close. And and you know, our what we consider a refi did a, a doctor who's also a close friend. I'm not going to mention more names. I'm just going to myself into more trouble. But there are others <laughs> that were not mentioned. And I just want to say that I, I dropped two names. It does. I apologize to everybody else who I was who wasn't mentioned. And I hope our friendship will remain as strong. I'm confident our friendship will not be disturbed by lack of mention on the postcast. And I think that the really good doctors they have absolutely no time to listen to this. So they have no idea. What, you know, this will never get back to them. But I just wanted to make it clear to all the to, there are people who are listening who say, "Oh, he didn't mention that at all." It's, you know, let it, let it be. It was meant as, as an instruction and, and uh, they shouldn't feel, take, take any offense whatsoever. Thank you. Okay. So my trip to Chicago. <laughs> so first of all, I, I, you know, there are some alum that live in Chicago. So I posted on Facebook, you know, the, the, my brother, it was my brother's 70th birthday. So he wanted me to come, me and my two brothers, we went to, to be there for the Monday night birthday for Brenny. Okay. So I post, I post on Facebook, put, you know, his announcement in quotation marks. And I said, my brother, and it talks to her about seven, please come my 70th birthday. Figuring that people realize that I am not going to Skokie to celebrate my 70th birthday for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's not the, the time my, birth, my birthday was a month ago, uh, two months ago, number one. Number two is, I'm not turning 70. And number three is, <laughs> why in heaven's name would I go to Chicago, to Skokie, Illinois, to celebrate my birthday? Nonetheless, a couple of people totally thought that it was my birthday. And I'm getting mazel tov. And like, uh, one guy actually was there. And I said, I'm going to bring some stuff over for the Fabrengen. I'm saying, oh, that's nice. Bring some stuff for the Fabrengen. That's rubbing your eyes. You're looking too tired. So, uh, we're looking, anyway, so that was funny. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. So Hershey, who we had on as a guest, so some, I know something, he, he, I was sitting next to my brother and he comes from behind and I said, oh, here he is, the animation. And so my brother says, oh, the animator is here. I said, how do you know about him? He said, from the postcast. Aha. Uh-huh. <laughs> he said, without even looking, I know who he is. <laughs> And then there's another guy, a shliach on campus in University of Illinois. I don't know where it is. It's like a two-hour drive away from where we were. And he said he, he, his son goes to yeshiva in, in Chicago. So he, he, brought, he dropped off his son. And then he's driving back. And he said, you, <laughs> he started talking about the postcast. I said, look, you have two hours. That's four, four episodes. So I don't know if he's listening, you know, a little shout out to him. Uh, <laughs> so when I travel, because I don't like traveling in general. When I travel, I, I was like, my doing, you know, I need a sign from Hashem that it's the right thing. So I, we, we spoke about my trip to, to L.A. to the wedding. Met the guy in the plane with the tefillin from, from Honolulu. So that was a good sign. So 
on the flight there, like there was no tefillin action happening. And so I'm stepping all the way there. I'll be there for the Fabrengen and then get up the next morning, come back. It's two days of traveling and like the whole mice. So I'm on the, on the, um, the movable, uh, side walkway. Yeah. The walkway, yes. And I'm going and this other guy was, he was like running next to me. And he turns to me and he says, Shalom Aleichem. I said, Aleichem Shalom. <laughs> As I said to him, are you welcoming me to Boston? Are you a resident here? He says, no. I'm actually from Pittsburgh, but I, I'm here for a shiva call for somebody in Chicago. I used to live in Chicago. I moved 15 years ago to Pittsburgh. I said, oh, that's funny. My grandfather actually started out, I think one of the places that he was before he moved to Pittsburgh was in Chicago. I said, you know, my grandfather is. My grandfather passed away uh, 30 something years ago. Of course, you know, when I do this, I'll get one of my brothers or my sister will say, it actually was 29 years ago or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so he says, yeah, I think there's a building named after him. I'm like, oh, man, <laughs> <laughs> that's the best you can do. That's what you know about him. I don't think about it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been 30 years. Why would you know, why would you know him? So I said, okay, that, that, was, that was my sign. It wasn't a very powerful sign because he's going for a shiva call. So it wasn't. But it was a connection with another Jew, and I was. I said, "Okay, this is this is um, this is good. This is good." So, when are we having well, your brother on the postcast? When is that happening? Oh, so let me tell you about which brother. The one that listens to the postcast. Do they? Oh, that did, one. You know? I, well, so that one who mentioned it was. He lives in Crown Heights, but he's a shaykhit. He shaykh. Oh, so actually, even better. All right, right, right. Calm down. But here, let me tell you the deal with it. When, when I'm back home from Detroit, we need to take a trip and we need to have uh, some sort of a lesson from your brother. In Shkita? Yeah. D- aren't you certified or didn't you used to be certified? How does no, that I, work? Do you I, keep I, your certification after you <laughs> stop doing it? <laughs> you have to you have to shek at least three cows every year. No. So, so do, you, do you run to Crown Heights, shek a couple of cows and run home? <laughs> So here's the deal. The month, the, the summer, Hani and I got married in Elul, right? That's after the summer. Okay. And so that summer I spent in Pittsburgh with my cousin. See, the deal thing with this, my grandparents lived, lived in, in Pittsburgh. And so my aunt, when she got married, she lived in Pittsburgh too. And she was helping them run the school. And my uncle was a sheikhit. Okay. And he passed away relatively young. And so there is a thing called a chazaka. Chazaka means you, it's you're like you have a, you have a, it's, you, it's established and you, know, you have a claim to it. There is, a, there is some kind of concept like that in the shechit also. If you're a shaykh, it pass on to your, to your son. But it, he had one son, he has one son who lives in um, Connecticut, Stanford, and he's shaykh there. And a younger son who was actually what a group that the Rebbe had sent to Eretz Yisrael. Like there, was three, there was three different groups that the Rebbe sent, like three groups of ten at different times, uh, to be shluchim in Eretz Yisrael. And, and basically the idea was that they were actually stay in Eretz Yisrael, they were settled there, and some of them became leaders of cities and like all very prominent, met in prominent positions, most of them. So he, that's, what he, that's what his destiny was. He was, he was in Eretz Yisrael, and, and I'm, I'm not sure at that point if he was married, I don't remember exactly. And then my grandfather and then uh, or my aunt separately went by the Rebbe. And again, I don't have the exact details of the story, but basically the Rebbe said to them that my cousin should take over the position of being the Sheikhet in, in Pittsburgh. And he, well, he didn't Sheikh in Pittsburgh in, in Ohio, but he should take, it, take over that thing. And that was to him the biggest shock in the world, because if you know his personality, the last thing in the world you think he would become would be a Sheikhet. And a Sheikhet is one who... Um, kills the cows in, in a halachic way. So that's what happens. He became a, he became a sheikh. He became an expert sheikh. And he really, really, really good. And before I got married, I wasn't sure where we'd end up. And I thought my grandfather, my, my grandfather was a sheikh. Actually, my grandfather was a sheikh. And my father, if you be well, was, was a sheikh for a while. And um, my cousin said, oh, 
I was interested. And so when I was in Crown Heights, I learned how to shech chickens. But part of the part of the shechita thing is you have to learn how to sharpen the knife. And the knife is is like the blade is like that big. When you talk when you talk about for the blade has to be twice the size of the neck of what you're shechting. So for a chicken, a six inch blade is more than enough. When you're talking about uh, cat um, sheep, it's got to be like a foot and a half. When we're talking about cows; it's like two feet. Now, the, not, 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 that's one thing. The requirement is to be that 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 size. But what the challenge is is you have to sharpen the knife, so you have to make sure that it's completely sharp. So you have that you have to learn how to do it. Called shtela chalf. Anyway, I'm 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 talking too much about shkita. My brother will won't have anything to say to you. <laughs> so, so um, so I so I learned how to do that in Crown Heights, and then I went to spend the summer with him, and to actually learn how to shech shech cows and that. So. The two parts of it is you have to you have to be able to shech three cows or three chickens in front of an expert sheikh and you also have to get reviewed on the laws. And so that second part again ruined the laws I never did. Because I it ended up I my life was not gonna bring me to the kosher slaughterhouse, but to bring me to Boston. So I never ended up doing this. I know I know about it and it's, I learned how to do it, but I didn't actually get certified. Anyway, we we got off subject. So so Your since brother, when is he on? So we were in Chicago, and he was flying. They they flew in Monday night and flew back Tuesday morning. And he said, and that day or later that day, he was flying to Mexico to Shech to Mexico. He flies all over the place, all over the country, all over the world to Shech. So, you know, his schedule is not. And we have to, you know, plan it out when he'll be in New York sitting. In okay, front of so we'll the- plan it out. It's it's very easy. Hi, when's a Wednesday from now until whenever sure. that you're available? Right. Okay. So we'll we'll, we'll think about that. anyway. But getting back to to we're getting off subject. But the thing was, he knew the animator because. <laughs> so the it, it was fascinating to be there. I've been there before in Skokie. My brother has his shul, but I never saw him with his congregation. And here it was, you know, they set up, you know, big tables, like 50, 60 people sitting around the table and he's talking. And and me and my two brothers are sitting like, he's like in the middle of the table and, and we were on the side and just watching and, and just watching him and, how, you know, how he was dealing with them was fascinating to us. Because, you know, he's he's a very, um, how would you call it, cerebral, very, very analytical, sharp mind. And not given, to, you know, but sense of humor like everybody else has, and and is able to speak, and and but he's not like a performer type speaker. He's like, oh, let me tell you a story that happened to me. That's not him at all. So even though people confuse me with him, because it seems that we look alike. Now, <laughs> and the funny thing was, some guy in Chicago she said to me, "Who's older, you or him?" And I'm like. I'm gonna punch you. Like, what do you mean? Like, in my mind, I'm I'm the youngest of four of four brothers, and we have an older sister, older than all of us, and two younger sisters. So, to me, I'm like the younger brother. Even to him to suggest somehow I was older than than my oldest brother was like just bizarro. We but need anyway, we need a Posner month, and just get we'll get everyone on or month and a half really right. We'll get everyone <laughs> on in a row. Oh, Line well, them up. We'll see if that happens. But anyway, I'm gonna I'm gonna send you a picture. I should have done this before, but we see we're, we're totally discombobulated here. But anyway, let me let me just. Um, so we were like watching him and and listening to him, and, and it was fascinating. It was it was really beautiful to hear him to hear him to hear him talking and and uh, so I bring with his people. It was great. Um, are you and, emailing this to me or are you texting this to me? No, I'm I'm, I'm how should I do it? Either Actually, WhatsApp or email is going to be the fastest. WhatsApp or email. Okay, let's see. I don't want I don't want the people to have to sit here watching as as I'm looking for a picture. But okay, it's 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 not the people's fault that you're old and struggle with technology. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! They can survive. Right, here we go. It'll it, it'll be worth it. They'll see the picture. It'll be worth it. How did you send it? I um, WhatsApped it to you. Okay. Okay. Let's see um, if my WhatsApp updates, and that's the <laughs> that's the bigger one. If you, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not a big WhatsApp on the laptop guy. I just happen to have it every once in a while. 
So what my brother was talking about is that essentially he doesn't have brain. There's another guy there who also, you know, does programs and stuff in the Chabad house. And so he was giving a whole explanation why he didn't have brain all these other years. And now he's doing it because the Rebbe really wants it to happen and going to very intricate details about about why you are bring on, on your birthday and why the seventh year is important and why he's doing it. And uh, we, were, we were just sitting there having a good time and enjoy, enjoying the, um, his, his explanations and things like that. And then after that, and, you know, other rabbi, another, the head rabbi there of, of the Bezin, he came in and he, was, he gave a nice little talk about, he was talking about the tzitz, the golden plate, which in this week's parsha. The kain gadol wears a golden plate on his forehead. It says kodesh l'Hashem amongst all the other garments in the breastplate and all that. And how it's so important to have that the kain has to have concentration and not lose concentration when he's in it. And his question was like, why would it, how could the kain gadol, the high priest in the base of Yiddish, you have to tell me he has to have he has to he shouldn't lose concentration? It makes no sense. And he's saying just the opposite. Sometimes people get into a position of leadership and and because they're in that position, it goes to their head a little bit and they lose their concentration. And that's why the Torah specifically had to say you have to have concentration. And he goes on to, to uh, praise my brother that even though he's in, involved and he's in a leader and all that, he doesn't lose his concentration and he's, he's focused on doing the best job that he can. Anyway, that, that was something he was talking about that was kind of cute. Um, and people were coming and going and it was, it was really nice. It was really a beautiful setting. And then afterwards, it sort of, it, all, it broke out into a more... So where are you in this photo? I'm very confused. <laughs> I, you know, <laughs> I see two of the same you. people on the left side. <laughs> no, so, <laughs> so this, this is my brother. The, the one on the, on the right is my brother. It's his home um, that we're having dinner at. And he turned 70. And next to him is my brother Uri, who lives in Crown Heights. And next to him, my brother Chazi, who also lives in Crown Heights. He's the sheikh. And then there I am. Nice and calm, and um, yeah. So that was that. Then, the, um, hold on one second. Then it broke down into into a more informal, um, informal. Into into a more informal type of bringing, and and I just sent you that picture. And interestingly, people think, oh, my, you know, well, we probably it was drinking. Like, no, it was a very low alcohol imbibing environment, which is really was a really beautiful thing because his congregation, which is it's a, it's a community, it's a, a lot of older people. And I was watching them as much as watching him that they were listening with such rapt attention. And and it was, it was very, very um, important to see that when you're talking content, and it's important content, and you have reputation, people will listen to you with respect. You don't have to demand it. In fact, when he would start speaking, we don't know, no one like quiet everybody down. Just like all, like people just realize that he's talking, everybody started, you know, quiet it down, which I thought was a beautiful thing that there was a sense of, of um, basic their heritage and, and respect that when somebody's speaking, you don't have to bang on the table and ask people to be quiet. And uh, so that was a beautiful thing. And here we are. Later on in the evening, <laughs> you see the bottle over there on the right side? It's almost yeah. full. Now the This one's bottle. full, but this one's pretty much empty. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because we had a little time. And by the way, the animator's right there on the left side. That's Hershey. He lives in Chicago. And there again, you see, actually, it's funny because the position of sitting is exactly the same as in the other p- picture. It is, yeah. It, it just happened. It quite unquote just happened that way. Can now I also just say... How, it, all of you have the same beard shape going. You all have the <laughs> the like two things, you know, that split out this way. Okay, thank you for that insight. And <laughs> um, <laughs> the thing is, this is probably the, one of the few times I was actually listening because I wasn't doing a lot of talking. <laughs> you just went on a whole spiel talking about. How... <laughs> this is the second part. This is the informal part. So. <laughs> So now, here's one of the, the highlights that I, I, I knew I had to share this with you. So I'm giving over all my Rebbe stories. That's, you know, what do you do NFL brain? You do Rebbe stories. So I'm telling you different things. And then I mentioned the cottage cheese. 
somehow oh. came to and somebody said, "What? Well, tell me what happened. I said, no, no, no. For that, you have to listen to the postcast. <laughs> and, and so, and so then the, and ul- then the I said ultimate it. marketer over there. And so then I mentioned that uh, being cottage for the Rebbe. And so my brother, Uri, said, so like, oh, and I used to bring, he said, somebody said to me, do you ever bring the Rebbe the thermos? I said, what are you talking about? So I never, I never knew about this. The Rebbe would get from it, the, the Rebbe would send from the, from their house on President Street, would send the thermos with tea and milk. So the secretary would sometimes, I guess they would call from the house and would, he would find a bacher and ask him if he can go to the house and bring the thermos back. Uh, back. So what happened, so I, the Rebbe, at the front, house, the, the front door of the Rebbe's house, there was a front door and then there was another door, I guess, a little bit further in. So I leave the thermos in between the two doors. So the outer door was left open and their door was locked. So you would, you would pick up the thermos in between the two doors. So my brother says, like, Shlan, Shlan, yeah, I brought the Rebbe his, his uh, thermos a number of times. And then my sister in Israel, my oldest sister in Israel, she says, you know, because I, I wrote a little report for my sisters who weren't there because the men only for Brengen. I wrote a thing about, you know, some of the things that happened. And she says, oh, by the way, Shimon, who's her husband, my brother-in-law, he also, um, you know, brought, brought is one, was one of the thermos deliverers. Then my brother, whose birthday was, he pipes in and says, you know, thank you for coming, blah, blah, blah. Then he says, and also, I brought the thermos a couple times. He said, it was <laughs> You're getting one up by everyone here. Yeah, I was like, what the heck? How come I never brought the thermos? <laughs> This is such a little brother conversation. This is great. I couldn't believe it. And they were like excited. Today was like, you know, you had to you had to walk like two blocks to Rebbe's house and bring back bring the, the empty thermos back and bring the full one back to seven seven. I don't know if that happened many times in the day or just once in the day, once a day. I don't know exactly what, what how it worked. But that was like so fascinating. Because we were talking then, like what is what kind of foods does the Rebbe eat? And so we said Chocolate, we knew the Rebbe like like the chocolate, and and obviously we knew the cottage cheese, and now we have another item on the Rebbe's menu: tea with milk. Who would, who knew this? Who knew this? And so the British. <laughs> <laughs> it is what it is. But now we know it. It's it's important. Anyway, um, so yeah, so it was it was a it was very it was a, it was a wonderful trip. It was very fascinating to us to be together. With no, there was no there was no bar mitzvahs. There was no wedding. It was just. Came there no for my brother. No, no bar mitzvah so, boy names to forget. <laughs> so it was, it was a nice trip, and um, the importance of family. Every, every, I can't ever emphasize that, and the blessing of family. That's really the real thing. Because I'm the youngest of four brothers, so I. And in those days, like now, there's yeshivas in Chicago, in Detroit, in in so many different places, like Toronto, and my kid in New Haven. You know, so my kids went. You know, there's a yeshiva in France, but like I didn't know anybody, I didn't know of anybody in my days that went. We went. There was a yeshiva in Brooklyn, then you went to Morristown, then you are, and then you went. To, you know, one of the places we may have sent you. And that was pretty much it. So I followed the path of my brothers. They went to the Lubavitch yeshiva in Brooklyn, so I followed them. So the teachers knew me. Because I was like the fourth of three brothers. And so there was a certain familiarity. Oh, you're what's the name's brother. And there was also a certain expectation because my brothers are good. So I had to like follow in their steps and, you know, behave and do well. Da, 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 da. And so when, and that went also in, in Tomorrowstone. When it went, went to Morrison, the same thing also, which is past, you know, at, in New Jersey that were there for two years. So the same thing, it, it followed, you know, I followed in their footsteps, all, all four of them. All three of them following their footsteps, um, but yeah. So, it, but the benefit was that, on the one hand, there was a certain expectation. On the other hand, there was a certain like familiarity. I don't have to introduce myself. I'm just the next brother. Oh, you're the next brother in the family. I don't know. So that was that was, um, and and always you know always get advice from them or insights in how life goes. So I have to say, what I'm saying is that having older brothers was a big blessing. Were they annoying at times? I don't even remember that. I can just talk about the positive, and it was very positive, and it is still today. Till today, it's it's, it's really uh, fantastic, 
And my brother Rabbi's being Joe. nice because he doesn't want to put them on blast on the pose cast. But there are definitely <laughs> like eight different things that immediately popped into his mind. <laughs> Actually, no, I, I can't think of any things. No, I can think of a lot of things that I, I benefited or I inherited from them or, <laughs> or that they had done for me that, you know, paved the way and made it easier for me or that they still do till today. You know, I, my brother in Chicago, I'll, I'll call him for advice or for halachic insight or just to discuss something and get some clarity because he's like, he's razor sharp. He's not like, he, he's, I'm like mm, he's like, boom, 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 boom. So that was fantastic. So this week um, is Purim Katan. Mm. which is exactly a month from the big Purim. And, and um, so what, what do you do on Purim Cotton? You actually don't do anything. There's nothing to do. You don't like, it's just, it's just a month before the real Purim. And so the question is, should you do anything? And so it's interesting in Halacha, it talks about it and says that there's really nothing you need to do. You don't say Tachnun. It's like some day of celebration. And some say that you could, you should add on in, in the, like increase something in the meal, have a, some, an added dish or something. And the conclusion of all the four, and the conclusion of, or the whole section of laws, of daily laws, called Chaim, and, and which includes daily laws, Shabbos, Yontif. So this is the last, last line, because it's, it goes according to the order of the year and it goes, and of holidays. And so poor, and it goes to, the Torah holidays and the rabbinic holidays, Hanukkah and Purim. And Purim cotton is the last subject. And so it says, so the question is, should you add in a meal or not add in a meal? So the quote is, Taiv Lev Mishta Tamid. Quote, there's a quote from, from a, a Pasuk Mishle, that Taiv Lev, someone who has a good heart, Mishta Tamid is always happy, always having a party. So if you have a question, should you add in your meal on Purim cotton, be happy. It's, it's in general instruction to be happy. And the Rebbe has a whole long, fascinating talk about why is this the last halach in Shulchan Aruch and what does it mean initially. And, and one point that he says there, it's a, a lengthy conversation, I just wanted to give you a point, where he says that we find in the, in, during the year there are holidays that were, were meant to be happy. We start with the Torah holiday of Sukkot, Mansum Chaseni, rejoice on Sukkot, which is a Torah holiday. We go to Purim, and that's the time of the Temple. Purim happened outside the temple, happened in Persia, was not, so that is a rabbinic holiday, Purim is a rabbinic holiday. Then we have even a, a holiday which is not rabbinic, it's, it's a custom, that is Simchas Torah. Simchas Torah, is not, it's nowhere in the Torah it says it, it's not a halacha, it's, it's the end of Sukkot, Shemini Atzeres, but the day, it's, the, the concept of Shemini Atzeres, to end the Torah and dance to the Torah is not a halacha, you have to do it. It became, it's a, it's a minig, it's a custom. I mean, it's part of halacha now, but it's a, it's a, it's a minig, it came as a custom. And you come to, and so the Rebbe is saying that the, fur, the, the, the further you go, the less bound it is in the Torah. It's not the written Torah, it's rabbinic. It's not the rabbinic, it's a custom. It's not even a custom, it's just in the general concept of being happy means the more it's coming from the person themselves. Right? So if the Torah tells us to be happy, we've got to be happy. When we feel happy as Jews, that's coming from within us. So Hashem says, be happy on Sukkot. Be happy on Sukkot. To say, you know, you have to be happy. Eat matzah on Pesach, be happy on Sukkot. When the Torah doesn't tell you to do it and you are happy, you know, it's like always, when somebody tells you, to, in a relationship, when someone tells you to do something, you do it, okay, you're a good partner in the relationship. When you do something that you know the other, make the other person happy, don't ask for it, then, then you're like an excellent partner, like a husband and wife. If the wife tells you, asks you to do something, you do it like, okay, you're a good husband. But if you know there's something that she likes and you do it without her asking, it's even better, right? Obviously, it's more important factually if she asks you to do something, you do it, you know, ask you, why don't you do it? Right? And you say, well, I do things you don't ask me to do. Like, that doesn't, that doesn't, that doesn't work. So the Torah, the importance of the Torah holiday is obviously more in, in, as far as obeying, obedience goes, it's more important. As far as expressing true connection, true love, and true joy, the less it's commanded, the more it is, right? If somebody, say, if a husband always does what his wife asks him. He says, you see how much I love you? Always do what you ask me to do. That's not love. That's the one I ask you to do, right? So when you do things I don't ask you, that shows you really care about me. 
But if you do things that I don't ask you because you care, but the things I ask you, you don't do, that's completely out of whack. It makes no sense. It's like the icing on the cake. What's the concept of icing on the cake? So we, we ever say, oh, the icing on the cake is the best. But if you get the icing without the cake, ah, it doesn't work. So that's the same idea. That, well, so, so I let, let it go. Um, Purim cotton is like, it comes at the end of everything. It's the true joy that you're not commanded at all. It's not a Torah. It's not a rabbinic. It's not a custom. It's just true joy being one with Hashem. And that's the concept of Purim cotton. So I think that's, Something that we need to take away, as we talked about when we started, about people getting more involved in doing mitzvahs because of what happened um, on Simchas Torah on October 7th, that we have to hold on to that and not do, be, you know, like I met I met this guy on, fr- on Friday. He, he, he graduated from Northeastern. He used to go to Mendy's place for Shabbos. I said to him, I, did you put on tefillin? He said, yeah, I, put, I try to put on tefillin every day now because, because of what happened. And I said, what, what happened? And he said, because so many of his friends... You know, social media are like turning against Israel. He feels like closer to the Jews, which is fantastic that he feels closer and he's translating it. It's not fantastic that he feels isolated from them. It's fantastic he feels more Jewish and is identifying it and connecting to an actual act. But when that wears off, right, when things calm down, God willing, very soon, what's going to happen with the tefillin? we got to realize this event awoke on us or pointed out to us that we have something unique about us Jews, that we have, we have mitzvahs. And so the tragedy that happened, the terrible act that happened, that motivated us to recognize that. But don't lose the motivation. It's like the Torah tells us you must be happy on Sukkot. When it comes to Purim Katan, the Torah is not telling you to do it. But you're doing it because you're happy to be a Jew. You're happy to be connected to Hashem. So... That's 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 the message that we're, that we're saying here. When when something for you feel compelled to do something, it's fantastic. But when when you don't feel compelled to do, and you're still doing it, that makes it really valuable. So we should show the true joy of being connected to Hashem in the midst that we do. Hashem should show His true joy, reveal Himself to this world, and we should celebrate Purim Kat with Mashiach. Amen. And with that, <laughs> thank you so much for listening to episode 44 of the Postcast with Rabbi Shmuel Posner. We will see you next week.